into the meat of my talk, I'd like to sort of share some thoughts about what I think may be the most helpful for infectious diseases clinicians to, in terms of their conceptualization of uh, mental health and mental health in HIV. So their mental health, of course, um, is more than just mental health disorders. Mental health disorders are, of course, you know, the common mental health disorders, which are depression and, and anxiety, which, which really are the most prevalent issues in people living with HIV. But then, of course, there are also the sort of severe mental illnesses like, you know, the bipolar mood disorder and, um, and psychotic disorders, which are, are rare, but, but obviously very problematic in terms of clinicians being able to manage people living with HIV. And then there are the just the neurocognitive disorders as well. Um, but that isn't going to be the focus of my talk. My, the focus will be on what occurs commonly, which are common mental health disorders, depression and anxiety. But, but actually my experience of, of working with people living with HIV and particularly in adolescents living with HIV is that the, the most common reason for, for asking for my team's help is, is because of poor adherence to, to treatment. And actually what I find is that the most common reason for, for people struggling in terms of managing their illness and, and being adherent to their antiretrovirals isn't because of mental illness or a mental health disorder, but actually just because of an, an individual struggle with being uh, chronically ill and obviously living with a chronically stigmatizing or highly stigmatized uh, condition. So mental health, of course, isn't, isn't a thing that you, that you have or you haven't. It's, it's something that we all have all the time. And, and it's, it's about who we are as, as an individual. And, and obviously who we are as an individual is shaped by past experiences. And, and all of those things kind of come together when we are in a position of having to face our vulnerability, which of course is what physical illness does. It's, it means that we, that we are having to grapple with being ill and with being vulnerable. And each one of us does that in a, in a very different way. So just stepping outside of, of HIV, um, one of the most, I suppose dramatic places where we encounter that is in is in the oncology clinic. So Louise Frankel and I do a, a psych oncology service and a, a clinic where we where we bring the mental health service to uh, people who who have cancer and and we do that inside the uh, in the LE, in the LE block. Um, so just to give you an example, there may be let's say we have two two women similar age. Uh, similar, uh, similar demographics, similar upbringing, even similar culture, similar religion. And one woman, when finding out she has breast cancer, takes on the sick role immediately and um, is finding it difficult to kind of participate in the family and do the usual things that she did in the, in the home, in the family home and kind of checks out of life uh, a little bit and, and sort of, but, but is, you know, she's managing her treatment, she comes to her appointments, has the operation and, and isn't a management problem from that perspective, but in terms of how she's interacted with having cancer is that she has embraced the sick role. We have the next patient, again, similar background, et cetera, et cetera, who, doesn't stop working at all and and just kind of you know kind of soldiers on through this process and refuses to her family's help and offers for more bed rest and you don't have to cook anymore etc cetera, etc cetera. and she misses work when she has to have her operation and perhaps when she has to have her chemo but but just just won't engage with the sick role any further and just kind of soldiers on and this is not owning me and and off I go and and often what we find is that um, 
whether we as clinicians experience that as normal or abnormal or, or whether we think that's problematic is very much based on our own experiences of how we experience being ill. And then of course, also how we've experienced family members who've, who've been ill. So I think what's a really important conceptually to hold on to in terms of managing people living with HIV and how they interact with their illness is the most common reason for struggling with living with HIV and struggling with adherence isn't because they have a common mental health disorder or a severe mental health disorder or a neurocognitive disorder. This is just about a human being who's struggling to live with a chronic and highly stigmatizing uh, condition. And that's, I think, really important to kind of hold on to uh, conceptually is, and, and it's really important to try and understand what it is about your patient that is struggling with being ill and struggling with living with HIV and being um, non-adherent to treatment. So I'm going to kind of set that aside, the kind of notion that mental health belongs to all of us and, and mental health interacts with, with us being sick. You, you, can't, you, you can't separate out who an individual is and an illness. Illnesses occur inside people who experience being ill in, in different ways. I'm gonna set that aside and, and kind of launch into, into what can be researched and what can be studied. Uh, and that of course is, is uh, common mental health disorders in people living with HIV. So I am going to start sharing my screen. Is that good? Can yep, everybody see great. that? Great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So my team and I conducted a literature review of common mental health disorders in adults living with HIV, and we looked at all the literature from 2018 to 2020. Um, so I just want to thank, thank Sarah Bulawa and Nicole uh, for taking on this mammoth task. And it was a mammoth task. I think at some point, Sarah did threaten to bump me on the head if ever I asked them to do a systematic review again. So Sarah, I acknowledge that and on we go. Okay. Uh, right, so people living with HIV are at risk of common mental health disorders including a higher suicide burden. Poor mental health has been associated with HIV disease progression and poor adherence to treatment, making the treatment of mental illness alongside HIV key to strengthening HIV care and outcomes. Depression and anxiety may exacerbate many of the social and economic barriers to accessing adequate and sustained healthcare and are among the most challenging barriers to achieving sustained viral suppression. In fact, the burden of depression and anxiety is likely to have been underestimated due to the lack of appreciation. Of the connection, mental health can affect the progress towards achieving many of the SDGs, such as gender equality and empowerment of women, improvement of mental health, and of course, ending the AIDS epidemic. Women living with HIV have a higher burden of depression and anxiety compared to women without HIV and men living with HIV. Mental, mental health issues in women living with HIV, such as depression, PTSD, and anxiety are associated with poor quality of life and worse HIV health outcomes. Mental health symptoms, particularly depression, are also widespread among pregnant women living with HIV and have the potential to affect quality of life and clinical obstetric outcomes. Intimate partner violence is a global health problem of epidemic proportions with strong evidence that risk of intimate partner violence is heightened in women living with HIV and emerging evidence linking experienced intimate partner violence and HIV to an increased risk of mental health problems. This triple burden makes women in Africa 
living in the epicenter of HIV, all the more vulnerable. Mental health problems in people living with HIV have been quantitatively quantitatively associated with many other vulnerable groups, such as conflict affected populations, transgender and gender. By reviewing the most recent common mental health disorders studies in people living with HIV from 2018 to 2020, we discuss, firstly, the prevalence of common mental health disorders, factors associated with or drivers of common mental health disorders in people living with HIV, mental health from vulnerable groups, the impact of depression and anxiety on HIV disease progression, the impact on adherence to antiretroviral treatment and treatment outcomes, and the efficacy of different treatment approaches, including psychosocial interventions and psychopharmacology. After screening for eligibility, 142 studies were included in the final qualitative review. Only 27% were from Sub-Saharan Africa, and the majority of studies were conducted in the US, with the remainder of studies being conducted across Europe and Asia. We included all studies um, of people living with HIV 18 years and older with an age range of 18 to 54 years. Despite being, so I'm just going to go, going to progress kind of into the discussion and summary of the findings of our literature review. Despite the well-established increased risk of common mental health disorders in people living with HIV, the current prevalence remains high with studies reporting 28 to 62% of people living with HIV having mental health symptoms. Depression remains the most common mental health disorder with reported prevalence ranging from 14 to 78%. Severe depression prevalence ranges from 18 to 22%. Lifetime suicidal ideation, was identified in up to 38% of people living with HIV with 21% reporting suicidal ideation in the past week. High perceived stigma was associated with increased suicidal ideation. Anxiety disorders, particularly generalized anxiety disorder is commonly comorbid with HIV with up to 33% experiencing clinically significant anxiety. Internalized stigma has a significant indirect effect on anxiety through self-blame. Generalized anxiety disorder is associated with condomless sex, HIV stigma, poor ART adherence, and reduced sustained viral suppression. People living with HIV from vulnerable groups, such as perinatal women living with HIV, low-income women, survivors of sexual assault, transgender and gender non-conforming people, gay and bisexual men, men who have sex with men, prisoners and migrants are at particularly high risk of common mental health disorders. In perinatal women living with HIV, experiencing internalized stigma significantly increased the odds of reporting depressive symptoms. Suicidal ideation is most likely to be present and be sustained among women living with HIV who are experiencing intimate partner violence. Gay men living with HIV are reported to have poor recovery from depression and anxiety. Suicidality remains common in men who have sex with men who have significant associations with lower general self-efficacy and depression and anxiety. Within this population, major depression and internalized stigma are highly correlated. Transgender women have twice the odds of significant depression compared to MSM. Prisoners with perceived stigma due to HIV status are more likely to be depressed. One third of migrants living with HIV reported experiencing psychological distress. Screening and treatment for common mental health disorders 
are essential in improving HIV care in vulnerable populations. People living with HIV who are vulnerable to common mental, common mental health disorders frequently face significant individual, structural, social, and biological challenges to accessing and adhering to ART. These factors may be socio-demographic, local, environmental factors, social structures, individual factors, and HIV stigma. Depression in people living with HIV is significantly associated with lower social capital, unemployment, and low food security. In addition, greater functional limitations, poor coping strategies, low community support, internalized HIV stigma, poor self-esteem, poor resilience, and substance use are factors associated with depression and anxiety in people living with HIV. People who report negative life events that include financial problems, discrimination, and conflict with partners are particularly at high risk for depression. Adherence and, with, and depression and anxiety, depressive symptoms are associated with subsequent viral non-suppression through its association with self-efficacy and, and ART adherence. Sustained viral suppression is more likely among people living with HIV with no depression and good self-efficacy. There is also an association with higher stigma, increased levels of anxiety, sexual assault, recreational drug use and depression with subsequent poor adherence to ART. People living with HIV with depression and without disclosure of their HIV status to others are also more susceptible to poor adherence. In addition, adherence to ART, symptoms of poor physical health and depression are strongly associated with functional limitations and disability in people living with HIV. There is evidence that depression and anxiety and stressful life, life events can negatively impact disease progression, including decreases in CD4 cell counts, increases in viral load, and an increased risk for clinical decline and mortality. Findings also support that immune activation might be involved in depression risk among people living with HIV. Cortisol concentrations and inflammatory cytokines are higher in depressed people living with HIV and related to poorer learning and memory. There is reliable evidence that depression is associated with subsequent neurocognitive impairment. I'm going to move on to treatment and intervention studies. The positive news is that all treatment and intervention studies for depression and anxiety in people living with HIV work. The interventions range from CBT, group therapy, interpersonal therapy, problem-solving therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, behavioral activation, fitness, lifestyle, anxiety management. Online interventions included guided online self-help for depression, and a WeChat-based intervention for suicidal ideation, as well as telephonic administered therapies in two studies. So it really seems that given the wide range of successful treatments that the common thread to these interventions is providing people living with HIV with much needed support, social connections, and a positive therapeutic relationship. task shifting and integrated care. Interventions delivered by lay health workers, community home-based carers and nurses were only investigated in three studies, which is concerning, given the limited number of psychiatrists and psychologists and other mental health professionals working in low middle income countries. In fact, the current WHO data on number of psychiatrists per 100,000 population in Africa is 0 0.9, so less than one psychiatrist per 100,000 population. In comparison, the United States has 16 psychiatrists per 100,000 population. Several systematic reviews have reported the use of task shifting for mental health focused on specific populations, including people living with HIV. 
In addition, there are few studies investigated the integration of mental health services with HIV treatment services. Mental health and physical health are interconnected and early detection can lead to improvement in treatment outcomes and increase cost effectiveness for the healthcare system. While the evidence base for mental health treatment and interventions with people living with HIV is very encouraging, the majority of research on mental health treatment and interventions has been conducted in high income countries rather than lower middle income countries, which really is a significant mismatch to the global burden of HIV. In conclusion, despite the significant challenges that depression and anxiety present to successful HIV treatment, there are many mental health treatments and interventions that really can improve outcomes in people living with HIV and opportunities to task shift and to integrate mental health care with the physical care of people living with HIV. Online and telephonic interventions are effective and worth exploring due to COVID-19. However, many of the most at risk population in lower middle income countries are also the most likely to have difficulties accessing the internet and adequate cell phone reception. That's it. Okay, fantastic. Um, thanks very much, Jackie. If we can, um, yeah, great. If we can stop sharing. Thanks, thanks very much. It's a, a really interesting overview of uh, what is clearly a major, a major issue. And thanks for presenting that. So, I mean, colleagues, uh, there's a raise hand button, as you know, in the um, participants for those that would like to to make comments. And I'm delighted that we've got a number of number of Jackie's. Uh, colleagues here, including Louise and Nada and, and others from the unit, and would be very interested to hear from you. Um, I'm going to use Chair's prerogative and start off the questioning. Um, I mean, to us, we, we now face not just a, a, an epidemic of HIV, but an epidemic of, of defaulting. And really, you know, there's very little difference between the people we see in this hospital um, in terms of their you know, the advanced immune suppressive state, uh, as it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, sometimes it's just that they're on treatment, but have defaulted. So the, the critical question, I think, for us, in part, is, you know, what interventions should be put in at diagnosis, um, at presentation to hospital? I and mean, you talk about, and correctly, you know, I think everyone, we would all agree, this issue of holistic, holistic approach, and integrating mental health in uh, with the physical health side of things. But what has been done and what is most successful at the earliest stage to identify these people? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'll just kind of reiterate that the, the, the most common reason for, for people being non-adherent to treatment is not a mental health reason, right? Yes, there is a really significant association between having depression and anxiety and poor adherence. And um, if the studies are anything to go by, a significant number of, of the people that you treat will have a common mental health disorder. Um, I mean, the studies range from about 22% in some to up to 78 in others, which is, which is really horrifying. Um, it, it really is about, you know, the, the, each individual's personal struggle with kind of coming to terms with the fact that they now have a chronic illness, a chronic stigmatizing condition. I think the most important thing to do right at the outset is to, is to provide people with the space and the time to, to talk about how they feel about having, this, about having this condition, which, I mean, again, is very problematic in very, very crowded and very busy, busy clinical settings. But it, it is absolutely worth investing in in the relationship with your with your patient because relationships definitely do make a difference i mean if lucy kluver's study is anything to go by she's a professor of social work at uh, at oxford and who i work with in in terms of some of our studies with adolescents living with hiv most of the time you know outcomes for adolescents living with hiv are improved not not because they go to a, a therapy session 
but it's relational. It's, it's about the relationship with the caregiver. So the first thing is, of course, is to, to facilitate the relationship with a caregiver, we need consistency in caregiving. And that's also, of course, a huge, a huge barrier here. So do we have the luxury of, of saying to this patient that this is your doctor and when you come back, this is the person that you're going to see, but these things do actually improve outcomes and improve adherence in people living with HIV, that you, that you get to see the same clinician and you over time develop a relationship where you can talk about your worries and your difficulties. Common, commonly, there's also you know, issues come up with how healthcare workers interact with people who are non-adherent. Often we make things worse, unfortunately, with how we approach the conversation with people who are non who are non adherent. Um, if people are are failing treatment, um, I mean, Lucas's uh, talk I think it was about two weeks ago showed that at least half of those people are going to be failing because they're non adherent. Did I understand it correctly? It was more than that, but but yeah, but so it. It really is a significant problem and probably the biggest cause of people failing treatment is not adherence to treatment. So what, what's really interesting, if you particularly uh, young people, youth who are who who have developed uh, living with HIV, who have developed close relationships with are are able to share their kind of long journey with with living with HIV and, and what it's like interacting with healthcare workers. So commonly what happens is the first question is are you taking your treatment? And if you ask that question, they just shut down because what they're expecting thereafter is a blast lecture about how bad they are and about how much they, you know, and they're going to die and it just doesn't work. I mean, what I find is really helpful in terms of starting a conversation with somebody who you know or you suspect is non-adherent is saying something like, when you when you put your pills in your hand, what do you think or what do you feel when you see those pills? And if they start talking about feeling bad or feeling angry or, or, or feeling useless, the chances are that's a non-adherent patient. And, and, and the questions of why don't you or why aren't you this only serve to separate you from that patient. And that means the chances of adherence are you're not you're not helping you're you're not being a helpful participant in that in that individual's journey so stop the are you taking your your treatment questions they've been asked a hundred times before and invariably what somebody says is is yes even though you know the answer is no so it's an incredibly unhelpful question how do you feel about your hiv illness at the moment is another helpful question are you able to look at your antiretrovirals? What does it look like when you, when you, you know, when you see them and they're next to your bedside? You know, what are the barriers for you taking them? Like start a conversation as opposed to like a yes, no thing. Because it just like it doesn't work. Um, and it's not, it's not particularly helpful. And to also be really non-judgmental about whatever the answer is. Again, getting angry and inserting your feelings into this is not, is not helpful. We don't know what it's like living with, with HIV, or certainly I don't know what it's like living with HIV. I try, and, I try and experience it through my patients, but I'm never going to absolutely know. And our role is to try and understand what it is they're going through, be empathic, and be a, a treatment partner with them in terms of you know, their journey, in terms of living with this illness. That was a very long answer. No, no, it was very, it was a very good one, and, and it resonates well. I mean, I, I must say that I... Yeah, in the beginning, I started off exactly as you, you know, made that mistake of getting very upset uh, almost, and you know, it, it wasn't helpful. And I, I must say, over the last few years, I've sort of completely shifted to starting off the conversation by saying how much, how difficult it is that, you know, I know that I don't take pills when I need to take pills, and that we all have difficulty. So that it immediately changes to an inclusive, you know, issue, but. Again, I'm just waiting for, I'd like, I'd like Sipo, um, particularly Sipo's um, thoughts on, on this, because, you know, from the clinic perspective, I mean, I guess we do see, you know, it's a biased sample, but I guess, despite the fact that you know, not all patients are defaulting, obviously, because of mental illness, as you say, I mean, what, what is being done to identify people with mental illness 
in in the clinics um, in particular and when they're presenting because you know that in terms there were there wasn't quite a lot of work i think on screening tools um, initially how successful have they been and what should we be using um, out there in you know in the field and then i'll ask um, once you, you've, you've had a chance to deal with that and ask sipo and then um, maybe if louise and others can can make any observations that would be great thanks I think a screening tool is is really only as good as the investment somebody has in administering the screening tool. Um, uh, screening tools can be administered because, oh my gosh, it's something like I have to do and like, uh, you know, and, and people pick up that kind of attitude and aren't likely to share particularly a very sensitive question like, are you thinking about suicide? So I think that's a huge barrier, particularly if people feel, so I guess what, what needs to shift for a screening tool to be useful is for the people in the ART clinic and the HIV clinics to feel invested in the mental health of the patients and people can feel that, that investment. I mean, this is sounds, you guys are probably rolling your eyes, like, oh my gosh, I sound like such a psychiatrist. Um, but but it really does does matter if it feels like uh, a burden administering a screening tool and it's like oh something i just have to do nobody is going to tell you how they're really feeling um i think it really has to be done in a caring and empathic way for a screening tool to be useful otherwise they are literally completely useless and don't even bother I mean, there are things that are really obvious, of course, about picking up. I mean, if somebody's crying, I mean, obviously, but of course, you know, sometimes people cry and they're not depressed. Um, so I think, I mean, it's not just about one symptom. It's about, are you struggling and do you feel down a lot? And there's often a lot of crossover between the physical symptoms of depression and, and, having, and having HIV, particularly patients who have AIDS, like um, loss of weight and low energy, for example, they're symptoms of depression. They're also symptoms. And I think that's one of the reasons why people struggle to pick up depression is because of this kind of overlap. So focus on the psychological aspect of depression. Do you feel down? Do you, feel, how, you know, how long have you been feeling down? Do you feel down all the time? Do you feel hopeless? And, and of course, you know, the worrying thing is about suicidal ideation. Well, thanks very much. Um, Zeska in the chat, you've, you've made a very good point. I wonder if you'd actually just share it with us in general, because I think this talks in part to the problem that Jackie was mentioning about, you know, multiple changes in practitioner. Zeska, do you want to just share what you were, were suggesting? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was just, so I'm a clinician in an ARV clinic. And uh, often just before our patients go into um, the um, club care, um, they do their month four visit with me and, and I give them enough time and space and they can talk about how they're feeling and often. So right at the beginning, it's, they don't always open up and tell you how they're feeling, but around month four, after everything is settled, if you ask that question and you give them enough space and time, they do open up and it is about these, um, not really depression symptoms yet, but just struggling with their, um, you know, with their, with their diagnosis and that internalized stigmatization that you were talking about. So those things come up and it's usually after uh, a couple of months. So yeah, so I don't know if, if that's maybe a practical thing that just before they go into, you know, the, um, <clears throat> uh, care models um, that you know, the clinician should just do a definite check, give them enough time and space, and then, um, yeah, basically check in with them, how they're feeling. Great, Zesco. I mean, Jackie, does that resonate? And any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what allows patients um, to heal is not the pills, but but the relationship with the, the healthcare service and the and the healthcare worker. Uh, it's, it's more important than you realize in any context, never mind just in people living with HIV, but in absolutely in any context. Uh, we're human, they're human. It, it is about a relationship. Great. So Sipo, your thoughts from, um, from Lake Como? 
Uh, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, and, and thanks, Jackie. Very, uh, very good talk. Um, and I just want to reiterate what you said, Jackie, and it's quite true, is the consistency of the caregiver. I certainly, over the years, have come to appreciate that uh, in our clinic where one gets to know these some of our patients over a long time. And actually, uh, it then becomes easier to have the conversations about the challenges that they are they're having in terms of, uh, of their care. But uh, even in our clinic, you know, um, uh, one still has a challenge where we do have uh, practitioners or registers uh, uh, changing every three months. And uh, it's, it's very difficult for everyone to have a consistent uh, practitioner. But um, the real question, uh, Jackie, for you would be, what uh, skills do uh, healthcare workers need to have these conversations with, with patients about, uh, you know, going, starting the journey with uh, long-term care in terms of treatment? Because it's, it, I sense that we, we don't have the tools to, to have that conversation. So for example, you know, in many of our clinics, we've got uh, lay counselors and the clinicians assume the lay counselors are gonna have some of these conversations. The counselor assumes that the doctor is gonna have the conversation with the patient and, and neither of us do that. And, uh, and maybe the truth is that neither of, neither of us, the lay counselors or the health practitioners have the tools to say to patients, this is, these are the tools you need to deal with your life. For example, is having uh, to deal with a lady whose son is uh, taking tick and uh, has to hide a tablet at home. I mean, some of us may not understand that context. Uh, you may have a sort of intellectual understanding of it, but the practical living through that, how do you um, give somebody the tools to deal with that kind of life situation? Often the problems are just dealing with daily life. I, I think in terms of, if we, if we focus on, on the primary outcome being adherence to treatment, I think a really good model is motivational interviewing. So it's a, it's a style or an approach to having a conversation with a patient that is, that is about um, resolving ambivalence. It, it's, it's a way, it's a, I suppose it's a set of tools that, that can really help guide a patient to resolving that ambivalence about how they feel about their illness and their treatment. So motivational interviewing doesn't mean that it's that it's therapy. Um, it can just be a set of skills that you use and can take two to five minutes. Goodman, are you still on the call? Are you there? Are you out there somewhere? Uh, I don't he, know if you want to say- He had to, uh, Jackie's put on the chat that he's had to um, uh, oh, join another webinar, apologies. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, so uh, Goodman Sebeko is, he's in our department and, and um, and does some work in training uh, lay counselors and, and other healthcare workers in, uh, to use motivational interviewing. And I really think that it is a skill that all healthcare workers should learn. Um, we've been thinking about, about providing training sessions just to help healthcare workers manage vaccine hesitant patients, because it is, it's been used in so many different contexts in turn, because it is about behavioral change. And um, whether it be managing your diabetes differently or getting a vaccine or being adherent to antiretrovirals, it is, they're really a simple set of skills that, that anybody could learn. Um, so, but in terms of the other thing, uh, Sipo, you were talking about kind of other issues around um, how do you manage HIV and, and manage a uh, somebody at home who's who's abusing substances. I mean, there are the different techniques. Again, very easy to use ones like uh, problem solving therapy. But again, they're super easy to use, and it doesn't mean therapy. It doesn't mean you you know the patient has to go to sort of weekly counselling with you. It's just it's just about learning a different way of relating to and speaking to patients. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's loads of super helpful stuff. It's just about First of all, are healthcare workers and doctors going to be interested in learning this kind of thing? I mean, it makes relationships with patients so much easier. So, I mean, from my perspective, I'm thinking, ah, oh, I mean, if, you know, everyone should be interested in learning something like this, you know, but the uptake in terms of 
non-mental health professionals engaging with mental health stuff, which is what it is, 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 is poor for, for so many different reasons. Um, so, great. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to ask Louise to, to come in. She has her hand up, but I think we'd like to book um, our, <laughs> our unit assess some sessions, please, and we're happy to <laughs> provide various um, inducements. Um, Louise. Yeah, we'd love to do that. We'd love to do that. I, it, it's, I, I suppose I just want to reiterate what, what Jackie's saying, that um, motivational interviewing is really helpful in terms of having tools. It's, it's also just about um, a way of listening. And I think what's often so difficult in our pressurized work is that we, you know, the, the, and, and the medical model is about fixing things. And actually, you have to ha make a sort of internal shift to think about um, working with, with your patient in that time that you have, to think about what's difficult for them and to help them to find some solutions. So the, the problem solving um, thing is, is actually really helpful. You look at the things that you can change and the things that you can't change. And then you work on the things that you can change and you get the person to think about what's possible for them. And sometimes there aren't possible things and um, it is difficult and you have to just be aware that as the doctor, you feel pressurized to make things better. And the way you can't always make things better, but you can be present with the person while they talk about the difficult things, not in a therapy way, but just in a human way. So when you say we don't have all the skills, I think doctors do have skills because they're people. You do have skills to just listen and think together rather than give advice. Yeah. No, that's a great point, Louise. Thanks very much. And I think um, the male members of the audience will, you know, need to need to um, be included. Need to uh, keep that very much in mind as we sort of have this, you know, this men are from Mars sort of issue where we don't tend to listen, but we like to. I mean, like it's not only men, but I mean that you know it's a it's a, it's a bit of a you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but I recognise it in myself and in and many in many colleagues, and we do need to listen. So I think this is incredibly important and motivational. Yeah, uh, so some some lessons in this would be would be fantastic. Um, I mean, the other issue is you know, just to come back to Sipo's point, um, people you know falling through the gaps in our clinics because. You know, obviously this can, depression, anxiety may not be pre-existing and it can occur each time. Um, I mean, how, are there any practical, again, any practical tips when we have relatively small amounts of time with the patients that we not only in the, you know, in our sort of specialist clinic, but also in, you know, in the primary healthcare clinics, um, you know, as Zeska sort of mentioned and others, I mean, is there a, what would you what 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 would you suggest? I think it's incredibly important, um, given how common depression anxiety is in people living with HIV, for infectious diseases and other clinicians who are working with this population, to just start antidepressants if you think somebody's depressed. Um, you don't need you know, you don't need a psychiatrist to start an antidepressant. And given the fact that there are few psychiatrists, um, what, what worries me is if you think, if you, especially in a very pressurized service, and yes, we do have psychiatric registrars that work in the community mental health clinics, but they go, they go once a week um, to their clinic. And what's nice about it is, is the fact that, that a registrar will go to the same clinic for three years. So at least there is some kind of continuity of care. But again, the burden of mental health disorders is absolutely massive. So those clinics are often kind of filled up with people with severe mental illness. So again, the common mental health disorders, which are the most you know, prevalent disorders and unfortunately cause significant uh, morbidity and increased suicide risk are often exceptionally neglected in terms of um, mental health services. I think it's really important that if we know that there's a medical population that are at risk for mental health disorders and you think that somebody is depressed, start them on an antidepressant. Um, 
Sartaliprim is a really good one. There are very few drug interactions with antiretrovirals. It's also very well tolerated in people living with HIV. So I would say just start with that and see where it goes. If it doesn't work, then maybe call you know, a mental health professional in. But I really do want to encourage people out there that mental health, because it's so prevalent, shouldn't belong to mental health professionals. It should belong to all clinicians and for all clinicians to kind of have the confidence to make the diagnosis and to start the treatment. Great point, thanks. Um, I think we're, we're coming towards uh, the top of the hour, but um, Zeska again has an interesting question about um, whether we could you could touch on referral pathways in existing NGOs, such as Dreams for Adolescents and others. I mean, what's, what's the role there and what would your advice be in terms of referral? So again, I would like to encourage everybody to start to start treatment of depression yourself um, because the mental health services are absolutely overrun and things have only gotten worse since COVID. Um, all of our inpatient units are absolutely overrun, some by 50%, some by 100%, and, and there are massive backlogs in terms of um, seeing uh, a mental health professional in an OPD setting. Yes, there are NGOs, TB HIV care is a very good one. Um, uh, a very good one, actually. I mean, because they because they not only provide support in terms of antiretrovirals, but but also have a number of really great programs in which they run to support mental health and relationships between young people and parents and sexual and reproductive health. And that's also a very important part of managing of managing mental health. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my really huge concern is that mental health services are so absolutely overrun that we, we can't rely on, on mental health services to take care of this problem. It needs to belong to, uh, to everybody. No, thanks, I think that's a very important point. And I think we are reticent often to start antidepressants um, because I think in part, I mean, it's, it's a, a, a nod to the fact that antidepressants are, you know, are a, might be a patch up rather than, you know, it's not getting to the, getting to the nub of it. And that's why I think we often go for a, a referral. Um, yeah. But maybe earlier, you know, maybe that is what it would take and help to start the process off and make it easier to, to reduce the referral rate. I don't know. Um, I mean, Sean and um, Halima, you're also practicing HIV specialists. Any thoughts on that or on uh, what you've heard just as we come up to the hour? Yes, Halima. Uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for this very uh, thought provoking and helpful talk. Yes, I mean, I must agree that you need to get buy in from the patient because if you don't have that relationship with the patient, it's very difficult to get to the bottom of the issues. We often uh, get assistance from social workers and psychologists who then uh, down refer the patients to the local clinic uh, for psychology and social worker support. So that's very helpful. But I must say we as clinicians do very poorly at it and we really do need input from the allied disciplines. Thanks. Also our pharmacists do help quite a bit. Thanks. No, thanks, Halima. Actually, Jackie, that brings out a point, you know, just to, to, to expand on that slightly. I mean, there are obviously different options for referral or need. Um, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, social workers, uh, HIV counsellors. I mean, any guidance on who to go to in specific circumstances? Gosh, I mean, I, often our patients need, need all of the above. Uh, I mean, the patient that SIPO described, um, whose son is a substance user and taking tick. Um, you know, again, I mean, I, I hear what you say that sometimes it feels like, you know, giving what, what can Satelepram probably, you know, what can Satelepram do against this, you know, kind of incre this incredibly kind of difficult and tra traumatic kind of experience of this lady living with a son who's who's using who's using methamphetamine. I just want to, it, it, it can't change his meth use. It's not going to make her life amazing, but it will treat her depression, which may mean that she's able to think clearer, clearer about how to manage her son's 
behavior. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like, no, it can't stop that. It can't stop her poverty and it can't stop, you know, the drug use and it can't stop the violence and it can't stop, you know, the intimate partner violence or whatever's going on. Yeah, it, it can't do that. But it, it can help you to make better decisions and to protect yourself better. People who are depressed can't think clearly. Their insight and judgment is often impaired. They see themselves in a very negative light and often aren't able to think their way out of very difficult and complex situations. So yes, it can't change everything, but sometimes changing a little thing really does, really does matter. Social workers, oh my, I mean, again, huge, hugely valuable resource, but again, completely overrun. And yeah, I mean, it's almost every single one of my patients would benefit from social work input. But again, what can a social worker do in terms of kind of stemming the tide of all of these incredibly difficult social things that are that are that are happening to to our patients i mean many of of our young people that we look after who are living with hiv we refer to social work we there's some really bad stuff happening at home we get dsd involved we fill in the form 22 and absolutely diddle squat happens in terms of protecting this child so yes papani you're out there somewhere i don't know um Pani's a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I don't know if you want to make any additional comments to that. Yes, social workers, yeah, absolutely amazing. But wow, I mean, what a mammoth task they have to, yeah, to support particularly young people living with HIV. Great. So, uh, Papani, would you like a, to make a comment? I, I agree with, uh, with Jackie. Sim the, the, the demands um, are quite high uh, on the allied health professionals, including social workers, but I think they have a critical role to play in terms of understanding and supporting the social related uh, stresses that impact uh, young people, including children and adolescents. Thank you very much. Last question, Jackie. Um, obviously, outreaching to, you know, is a, is a problem because it's just, you know, as you said, the 0.9 of a psychiatrist per 100,000, I think was the figure. Is there any role for um, sort of a, a telephonic or web-based platform to support um, doctors and nurses in, in you know, areas that do not have access to psychiatrists, psychologists as, as we're lucky to do? Yeah, I really do think so. I mean, I think I think in terms of given the burden of mental health um, disorders and particularly um, the fact that chronically ill patients are at even higher risk than the, gen than the general population and, and my feeling that mental health needs to belong to all clinicians is that task, task shifting is massively important. It's not difficult to prescribe an antidepressant. It's actually not that difficult to identify somebody who's depressed. And, uh, and, and again, I mean, what's really important is to, is to empower all care, healthcare workers with the tools to improve their relationships with their patients, because that really is, I mean, the healing happens in the pill you put in your mouth, but it, but it extends far beyond that. It's a sense of being cared for um, is, is, is huge. I mean, it really is massively important for somebody who's chronically ill. Do you know who I am? Do you know what my worries are? Do you know where I live? Do you know, do you know who my kid, you know, do you remember my kids' names? I mean, those kinds of things really, really matter. Um, and, and if somebody feels cared for, they feel safe. If they feel safe, they're more likely to listen to you. They're more likely to take your advice. That's fantastic. Really safety, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic point to, to end on. And thank you. I mean, firstly, thank you for giving us carte blanche to start um, prescribing citalopram. I'm not sure that the hospital are going to be particularly happy when their drug budget goes through the roof uh, within the next few days. Luckily, it's a weekend and might, uh, so there'll be a lag. But no, I mean, joking apart, Jackie, this has been a fantastic talk and, and thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, thank you for you know, such a thoughtful talk. Um, and really, you know, so much of this is in the discussion. Um, and I think you've, you know, you've really uh, uh, provided us with some, some great answers too. 
what are often felt to be unsolvable problems. Um, but I think it's given us a much better idea of how to go forward in our work. And, and I think it also you know, really, really strengthens the, the feeling of collaboration between um, our unit and uh, consultation liaison psychiatry, um, because you really have, you know, for the last, well, certainly, certainly since 2007, seven eight when I you know, became head, I mean, it, you've really revolutionized, helped to revolutionize the service for our HIV uh, population and our ID patients. So thank you to you, thank you to Louise uh, and the whole team, Nada, everybody involved um, from your unit um, and look forward to further collaboration as we go forward. So I wish everybody a, a very happy weekend. Um, you know, be safe and enjoy and be kind to yourself and uh, get some good mental health in this weekend. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, have a great Thanks weekend. for having me. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. Jeff. Yes. thanks.